To the trumpet blast, I come to you tonight to sing the songs I thought best not to sing. Songs so full of you, my darling, the listener would think that only your ears are the ones destined to hear them. Your lips the only ones to give them praise. When you're not there, I continue to sing them to anyone who will have my company. If only to share what you have done to my chocolate heart. To tell the world how you have turned my dilapidated organ into a piece of candy. A piece of candy that under the sweet rustling of your breath, the fire of your kiss, and the limpid pools of your lips turns to nothing. Brown, 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 brown that seeps up into my head, onto my hair, and the only remnants you can see are in my eyes. Sixteen Lincolns. I wish there had been sixteen Lincolns instead of the twelve that a street artist painted on the side of three apartment buildings, one laundromat, and one mailbox in my old neighborhood. As a child growing up in the capital of the great state most associated with him, the city that carries the spirit of the emancipator as a badge of honor, the city where he is venerated as a god, I battled Abraham Lincoln's fame daily. Growing up in Springfield, Illinois, I never thought I would be struck right here between the eyes while at a tiny intersection on a quiet block in one of the more suburban Brooklyn neighborhoods. Lincoln, you haunt me. But those 12 Lincolns stared at me the way I stared back at them. The vestige of the rail splitter rendered in black spray paint creates the appearance of tears. Tears for the greatest Indian killer since Andrew Jackson. Tears for the countless wars on sacred ground that would one day become reservations. Tears for, uh, tears for 36 Lakota men he ordered hung. The greatest mass execution of Americans by Americans. Or were they possibly tears over his own assassination, which he supposedly predicted? I've wrestled with Lincoln the way that Lincoln wrestled with that bully Jack Armstrong outside his cabin at New Salem, Illinois. New Salem, just outside of Springfield, about 30 miles. It was an obligatory field trip for many a fifth grader, including myself. <laughs> I've wrestled with him because the children of Springfield were never allowed to question history. Was he a racist? Was he gay? I hear those questions now. Was all this slavery stuff just motivated by his own political ambitions? Was he God? Did he build my hometown brick by brick? You can't question Anastabe, replied the monolith of my childhood education. Springfield feels like a distant memory. And since I've left that all behind, I've wanted to believe that Lincoln was out of my life forever. But those feelings changed when I noticed that now my best friend shares his birthday with Abraham Lincoln. At least those conflicting thoughts ran through my head until the other night when, while I was walking back to that old apartment, I passed those three apartment buildings, one laundromat, and one mailbox, and noticed that all the Lincolns were gone. After four months, every last Lincoln painted over. Totoro smile. My, be my day begins and ends with you. Eight o'clock in the morning, some twenty-some miles away, you tell me that I sit in the lap of a sleeping city, bringing my art to a new set of ears and eyes. And your Totoro smile brings me back to you, grinning from ear to ear, teeth bared, dimples depressed into your cheeks. Your spirit is younger than your 29 years, as mine is younger too, as I approach 40. Yet, 
Should I, at 36, not know the wonders of a cartoon buddy kitty created by some Japanese guy in the middle of the 1980s? And yet, that bunny cat, like you, calls to me. As long as Totoro is there to amuse you, he's there for me. And I'll send you reminders of a helping hand out in the rain. And what do I learn from him every day? Only that our little girl will not have to search for a match to her spirit, to her spunk. When the neighbors say to me she takes after her mother, I will be filled with hope in those dimples and that smile. They will heap praise on all of us. And let's remember that the universe gave us Miyazaki to bring all of his heroines back to life, to bring all those myths that we long for with him, and to always remind us of Totoro's smile. How to survive a bad poetry reading. I'm listening to you as I look over to my fellow poet doodling in the margin of her notebook, fellow lefty, but she's to my right, little green men in need of escape. I am over you, poet, and your perverted understanding of my art, your performance, which brings death to those words which you think you bring so much life to. How do I not start myself from packing up all of my things and whistling some great Dylan put-down song? You know, Idiot Wind, Positively Fourth Street. I'm tired. Your poem is nothing but an MFA bullshit. In the end, the only words I want to scream is, Help me! Help me! While you're on your haunches, scrunched down, yowling like some Appalachian William Carlos Williams stereotype, I think you're channeling some type of agrarian muse. No, wait. I think you're constipated. <laughs> Autumn in the Mind. I feel like Autumn has been taken by all the other poets already. <laughs> Haven't Frost, Sexton, Merwin, Berryman beat me to it? Aren't the images always the same? Frosted pumpkins, fallen leaves, apple picking, real James Whitcomb Riley shit. You know he was born in October? And the smells are all the same too. Musk, death, burnt wood. Autumn doesn't produce those feelings in me, however. Deep in my soul, it's always Autumn. My inner world is caught in the feeling of comfortable introspection. We are always, almost always, approaching the Autumn of our lives. Why not embrace it? And it is the Autumn of my life I will look forward to. Not the sundown, not the winter. I stare out at those umbers, those purples and oranges of the multiple Autumn sunsets, and I look forward to them. Some would find all this depressing, but I find those moments of stillness caressing my eyes enlivening. They invoke the same sense I experience viewing the Vs of countless Canadian geese passing through the southern sky, providing me with an understanding of the comfort of routine and inevitability. Maturity is everywhere around me. That stereotypical maturity exemplified in leaf peeping in autumn in Vermont in visits to bed and breakfasts in fucking quaint Midwestern towns. It is actions like these which will define the autumn of my mind. I write these words welling up with the greatest emotion brought on by autumn, calm nostalgia. Not the nostalgia of gaiety, not the nostalgia of Christmas. So all these lines may be an answer to Frost or Sexton or Merwin or Berryman. I don't think I'm qualified to be in conversation with great American poets. Hell, I don't think I'm qualified to be in conversation with maybe great, possibly mediocre British pop stars. So let's talk about Van Morrison. Um, you know, I know a secret about Van. Search the internet for a word to describe his music and you'll always come across autumnal. <laughs> 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 
and every parrot's name is Polly. So I'm six years old, maybe seven. Before then, I had taken to water so, so well. Since my family would travel back and forth to Florida all the time to visit my grandparents, I spent lots of time in hotel pools. My father successfully teaching me to dead man's float without a hiccup. However, the process of propelling oneself with just one's arms and legs was something that he just could not help me with. Instead, I would hold on to the pool's wall, moving around it at a crawl, inch by inch, but still loving the water but I would hate the ever-present threat of chlorine-clogged lobes of my lung, feeling the inability to breathe. Maybe even worse, choking, dying. The simple fear of knowing that death existed terrified me. All these events happening right at the age when your mind realizes that death, for you, is a possibility. We made more trips to Florida that year, when I was seven, than we had ever before. See, my grandmother went in for open heart surgery. She lived through it that time. And there was this time that we visited her in the hospital and my mother and I tried to take care of my grandfather. I don't remember us being in any hotel pools. During that self-same summer, I only have one vivid memory of a pool. That pool with the cabana-like bathroom where I would change into my swimming trunks was where my parents had signed me up to take private swimming lessons. I'd walk in every week with my towel, Jason, on the bottom, still have that towel, uh, <laughs> on the bottom to take my private swimming lessons. And I would walk out onto the pool deck to the sound of a parrot most likely a macaw, which was sitting in a cage perched near the door to the pool. The parrot seems like a dream, but I'm sure this is all very real. I know it must be real, for I remember the last day I was in class. My mother decided to stay around the house that day instead of just dropping me off, and it was the day I cracked. I knew I wasn't going to learn to swim. Why waste the time? So with that towel, emblazoned with my name on it, the towel I still take to the beach and to the pool this very day, and with all of my street clothes on, I walk straight into the pool. <laughs> not the shallow end, not the five foot mark. No, straight into the section marked nine feet. I could have not made it. I could have drowned. But I do not remember any fear around that drop into the drink. Instead, all I remember is the laughter of that parrot. <laughs> I too am going to wean one. That's mostly red. Mostly red. <laughs> chaplain skates. What can be said about chaplain skates? As he uses them with such a plume in modern times, a film remembered more for its critique of capitalism today than for those moments when he's playing opposite one of the many, many loves of his life, this time Paulette Godard. Paulette Godard, 26 at the time, but playing younger, of course, it's Chaplin. She picks up the Mickey Mouse doll while Chaplin finds the skates. I have a side note about her. I didn't read any of the news when it came out two years ago about the brazen, degrading, and slash r bizarre way that Chaplin sexually, emotionally, and r physically unleashed his eccentricities, I think I'm using that word wrong, on the young, always young women in his films. I can't admit such sins from a man who wrote, and directed, and acted, and wrote the score to modern times. Have I mentioned modern times? Yes, it's my favorite film. If only the world, for a moment, could remember Chaplin's skates. There's a fearlessness about this performance, and although it really was all an act, he was skating with a mirror right below him, it always remains a moment of magic. He does his trademark little tramp and pretends to be blindfolded as Godard gasps in recognition of the danger. Wow.